signal language of the sea is abandon ship. Within a few minutes, all the science and skill of modern sea warfare are reduced to the simple fundamentals of survival. For this emergency, there can be no hard and fast rules of conduct. No drills or manuals can fully prepare you for the impact of the disastrous moment when a stricken man of war starts its death plunge. But there are precedents in action. The Navy Department at Washington has the most authentic data on sinkings and survival, compiled from the reports of men who have been through the experience. Here is the summary of useful information on abandoning ship, learned the hard way, by survivors from proud ships of war and dirty tramp steamers, from the South Seas to the Arctic. From the experience of these men, whose ships were sunk, have come suggestions of vital importance to all who follow the sea especially in wartime. Instructions on maintenance and handling emergency gear. On methods of leaving a sinking ship. Protection against underwater explosions. Techniques for swimming through burning oil. Defense against predatory fish. Floating aids. Strokes best suited for swimming under certain conditions. Simple ways of helping shipmates in distress. These reports of the will to survive and the ingenuity shown by our seamen go far toward explaining the amazing fact that more than 85% of the crews of ships lost in this war to date have survived and returned to action against the enemy. <laughs> The time to get ready to abandon ship is yesterday. Start now wearing your life jackets all the time. When you enter a combat zone, it's advisable to sleep in your jacket. In fact, if you're smart, you'll take it to the shower with you. A lot of us do. And some, well, just plan on wearing it everywhere. Abandoning ship, you can't take a full sea bag with you. So get your most important gear into one small packet. You were issued a good knife, either a sheath or a snap blade knife. Be sure you take that along. It is the most important single piece of gear you can have. You'll use it a thousand times. A whistle can be mighty handy to attract attention. A flashlight for finding your way around ship or signaling in the water. Perhaps some fishing gear. Never mind your camera or guitar. Stick to the things that may save your life. Wrap them tight in something waterproof and keep them handy while you turn in. When you're not expecting enemy action, it's easy to fall into bad habits. Hey, buddy, could you dress in pitch dark in two minutes? Well, let's see you try it, blindfolded. All right, now, get going. General alarm has just sounded. Your ship's been hit by a torpedo. The lights are knocked out, and it's dark as a pocket below. It's 
funny to watch, but if this was the real thing, it wouldn't be any joke. I know, I've been there. Now let's try it again, the right way. Here's one way to lay out your gear so you can get to them easily and be fully dressed in less than a minute. It's simple when you have things properly placed. A blind man could do it this way. First, the blow. Then the trowel. The May West. And don't forget your shoes. Maybe you can figure out a better system for yourself. Go ahead, but have a system. And don't guess it's good, try it. Incidentally, don't depend on any one route to the deck. Learn two or three ways of getting topside, just in case. Practice by closing your eyes, finding your way by touch. Get well acquainted with your gangway, and know it well enough to be able to find your way in the dark. Every ship has its traffic rules, both as applies to fore and aft and cross ship movements. Different types of ships have different regulations. Learn yours and make a habit of observing them at all times. Then, in an emergency, you won't be getting tangled up in a traffic jam. Same thing applies to abandoned ship stations. Know yours and how to get there quickly. If it's impossible to reach your own station, you'll have to go to another. But do it orderly. Don't stampede. Unless men report to assigned stations, some will be overmanned, with fellows getting in each other's way, while others will be undermanned and the operation dangerously delayed. Different ships have different ways of lashing their rafts. Some are carried alongside, others are held on stanchions. Each way has different problems in launching. But whatever the rig, the launching will be greatly simplified if every man knows his job and the gear is in shape. Is the track clear and greased? Is the raft resting free in the stanchion? Don't just assume that it's ready for launching. Make sure. All hanging rafts are secured by a wooden toggle. Salt air has a tendency to cause toggles to swell up and stick. But if properly treated with wax or oil, they will pull out with one or two jerks. When finally the ship's rafts are launched, if they are not secured by a painter, they may float away and in two minutes be gone with the wind. These painters should be free of the ship and long enough to reach the water. On every ship, some officer has the responsibility of making sure that every raft carries full supplies, medicine, fishing kit, food, water, and provisions, and that they're properly secured to the raft. There should also be a lanyard attached to each item of equipment and fixed to the opposite side of the raft, so that if the raft lands upside down, all you have to do is cut the regular moorings and retrieve the gear by means of the lanyard. These are just a few of the many problems that show up in actual operations. So if your senior officers seem to be a little strict in the discipline of abandoned ship drill, insisting on snap and precision and a full workout of all gear, don't complain. Now is the time to find any faults. If the day should come when disaster strikes, the well-disciplined company will be most likely to come through Many ships knocked out of action have stayed afloat for several hours, even after the order to abandon was piped. Premature attempts at escape have cost more men than actual sinkings. Stick with the ship until ordered overside. Follow orders. Keep calm. The Yorktown took half a dozen torpedoes and remained afloat until a couple of days later she was sunk by our own gunfire. Some merchant ships have been found afloat several days after having been abandoned by their crews and the crews are still missing. The best way to abandon ship is to go down a cargo net or a Jacob's ladder and step off into a lifeboat or raft. Yes, that's the best way. But you can't always do it the best way. 
Some ship's decks have freeboard equal to a three-story building. Here's the proper way to descend. Maybe it'll be your luck to have to go down a line. And that takes a bit of know-how. The ideal escape line is one with knots tied at intervals of every few feet. In any case, there should be a couple of knots near the water line so you can hold up a moment to give men below a chance to clear the way. Another method is to cinch the line over your shoulders, around your body, and lock it with your feet. With these methods, you can let yourself down without burning your hands or losing your hold. The weight of your body is snubbed at several points. Never dive overboard because of the danger of hitting something in the water and breaking your neck. The next best way to leave the ship is to jump, but look before you leap. Well, there may be floating debris or some of your shipmates in the water directly below. Pick a spot that's free and clear. If the ship is likely to flop over suddenly, go off the bow or stern quarter, where you won't get caught under the superstructure. Your jumping style is also important. Before taking off, fold your arms over your jacket so it won't rise when you enter the water. In this way, your face is protected, your life jacket is held down, and your arms act as a water break. In case of a ship with high freeboard, jump with straight stance, legs together, hit the water clean, and swim back up to the surface as quickly as possible. Oil is one of the worst hazards encountered by shipwrecked men. But getting clear of oil, even when it's on fire, isn't nearly as hopeless as most people think. Too many men have come through successfully for anyone to lose hope especially if you know something about various types of oil and how they behave. Take a heavy oil, for instance. It's likely to pile up in a thick coating, especially in cold water. On account of that thick film, it's next to impossible to swim through. There's no traction for your arms, and you just ball up with grease. But it has its good points, too. It doesn't spread fast, and it's not likely to catch a fire. Then there's light oil. It spreads faster because it's more fluid, so it has a thinner film. You can swim through it, but unless you know how, it's liable to choke you or blind you. Gasoline spreads quickest, and any little spark will set it off. But it's so thin on the water, it burns off quickly. Probably the worst danger from oil whether it's ablaze or not, is panic. Many a torpedo tanker has reached port badly burned, but still afloat. Best advice is, in fire, keep cool, and follow orders. Experience proves that oil doesn't cover as great an area as you might suppose. After a ship is struck and oil is escaping, as long as the ship maintains way, the oil will leak out in a narrow stream alongside then fan out astern. As the ship loses way and drifts, if the oil escape is to windward, the oil will spread in a large pool to windward. But there's clear water to leeward, so you can go off on that side. To keep clear of the drifting ship, take off from bow or stern and swim out of the danger zone. If the ship is drifting with the oil leak to leeward, the oil will be piling up in a deep but narrow layer against the side of the ship and probably streaming off around bow or stern. So, naturally, you'll take off to windward into clean water. Put off jumping into the inferno until it's your last resort. There's no point in jumping out of the frying pan into the fire any sooner than you have to. If you can't find clear water anywhere, at least pick the lightest patch and fight your way through. Swimming underwater is your best bet. Remove your life jacket, because for underwater swimming, it is just a hazard. Hoist your shirt to keep the oil out of your face and protect your nose and mouth. Jump straight. 
Hit the water flat-footed to clear a passage for your body. Stay underwater and swim with a strong breast stroke, as this demonstrator is doing. Look for the edge of the slick, try to clear it in one plunge. If you can't, you'll have to come up for air through the oil, making an opening. As you surface, lash out with a sweeping motion of your hands, take a breath, and duck under again. Repeat this maneuver over and over until you reach clear water. If the oil is a fire, the tactics are largely the same. On the jump, land flat-footed to splash the flames away from your body and face. Let yourself sink well down, then swim underwater about 50 feet and surface. When you reach the top, start thrashing to drive the flames back. Duck under again and repeat the process. Swim always against the direction of the wind. Stay as long as you comfortably can and come up high when you break for air, turning your head away from the wind to breathe. If possible, join a group of your shipmates. Together, you can make a big clear space in the water and it'll be easier for a rescue ship to spot you. Gasoline has a tendency to burn in patches. Because of its thin film, gasoline can be cleared fairly easy by sweeping the water ahead of you. Keep swimming to windward until you're well out of the danger zone. Naturally, the choice and preparation of flotation gear depend upon the rate of the ship settling. Big ships, carriers and battle wagons may settle for hours. Others may go down on a dive. Each has its own problems. For example, this carrier, put out of action, has lost most of its life rafts. Yet there are other means of flotation which, in the emergency, should not be overlooked. There are sure to be some planes on the flight or hangar decks, and each of these carries at least one rubber raft capable of supporting several men. Every man should know how these rafts are stowed in planes and be able to break them out in a hurry, though more than likely there will be ample time. Inflate the raft by opening the valve on the carbon dioxide cartridge. Throw it over, jump in, and grab it before the wind takes it. Tow away from the ship. When climbing aboard these rafts, have men on all sides to prevent the raft from flopping over. Break out the oars first thing. Assemble them and fit them into the rowlocks. A hand pump is provided to keep the raft inflated, and you may have to let out some of the air during the heat of the day. Make it your business to know the location and use for every piece of equipment with which the raft is supplied. These bags contain the following life-sustaining articles. First aid kit, six cans of water, emergency rationed food, matches and moisture-proof packages, can opener, flare holder and flares, and a can of fluorescein dye sea marker. Even a simple thing like a fishing kit will provide both food and drink to sustain life for many weeks. Don't let these precious lifesavers go down with the ship. Each one will keep half a dozen men afloat indefinitely. The inflation type life jacket is efficient and dependable unless you have left out the inflation cartridge. Maybe you have been embarrassed sometime by accidentally inflating the jacket. That's no excuse for not putting in a refill. Learn to handle it with care. Then, when there is need to inflate your jacket, it will always be ready. The case histories of flat top sinkings prove that there is little excuse for carrier crews entering the water unprepared. As the Lexington was sinking, the ship's company had time even to raid the ice cream stores. 
Perhaps you can't count on being able to pack a lunch. But certainly there will be time to dress properly and locate some sort of life jacket before going over the side. And there probably will be ample time to release all life rafts. On the other hand, ships can go down in a matter of minutes after attack. Too late then to think about the life jacket you ought to be wearing. If you've got it, okay. If not, you'll have to do without. Keep your clothes on. You'll need them. If you've got a life jacket, not even your shoes need be left. They'll come in handy later. The racing crawl is the fastest stroke. Sure, it burns up energy, but you've got to get out of the suction zone and away from explosions while you can, or nothing else matters. Usually, the problem is complicated by exploding depth charges, in which case, if you can swim a fast backstroke, now's the time. In this position, your body is best protected from underwater concussion. Sprint for about 100 yards away from the ship, and then save your energy. But stay on your back as long as the ash cans are popping. Remember, the more of your body above the surface, the safer you are. Keep your ears out of water your mouth open, and your chest and belly along the surface until the explosion cease. In a life jacket and a calm sea, staying afloat is no great problem. If you've been caught without a life jacket, it's doubly important not to wear yourself out or get panicky. This fellow's overdoing it, so he goes under. There's sure to be debris floating about, pieces of shot up life rafts, broken planking, crates, all of which you can use. Very little support is needed to sustain a man in the water. Just a light handhold on a floating object will enable you to stay up for hours. Even a bucket can be used to trap air. And as an additional support, a steel helmet can be similarly used. But don't jump or dive in with one of these on your head. It is possible to transform your clothing into a highly serviceable life preserver. Simplest method is to inflate your shirt, fasten the collar, and blow several breaths into the front opening. The wet fabric will trap enough air to sustain you for some time, and you can replace what leaks out. Your trousers can be converted into very practical water wings. Remove them and tie the end at each leg. Then, swing them overhead to fill with air and ease onto them gently. They'll support you until the cloth dries in the sun or you get careless and squeeze the air out, at which time you can refill and start all over. Other things, such as empty ammunition cases, mattresses, sheets, Pillow cases, shell cases may be employed as floating aids. As soon as possible, look around for shipmates in distress. Even in a life jacket, an injured man can easily drown, particularly if he has lost consciousness. Here's where your basic techniques of life saving come in handy. Thanks to the life jacket, rescuing this man is a simple matter. Take hold of the jacket collar and toe, making sure that head and face are out of the water. At the raft, if he is bleeding, take him aboard immediately to give first aid and to minimize the danger from predatory fish, which are attracted by blood. In rare cases, it may be advisable to turn your raft over. And utilize the flat bottom for giving artificial respiration or attending injuries. Rescues without a life jacket call for greater skill and training. Unless you're sure of your ability, 
Better not chance a body contact rescue. If he's able to hold on at all, throw him your shirt and tow from a distance. If the man is obviously exhausted, or if you know as much life-saving practice as you ought to, approach carefully, turn him, level off, and use the hair carry. Or if you're a strong swimmer, the cross chest carry gives better control. Wounded men should naturally have preference in the matter of space on rafts and boats, as able-bodied men can hang on around the sides. As soon as possible, and certainly as darkness falls, start rallying your shipmates into as compact a group as possible. It may be some time before a rescue ship picks you up. Meanwhile, there is security in numbers, and companionship helps morale. Also, it is easier to locate a group of men, and its members help keep each other warm. Nobody has to tell you to keep a sharp lookout for rescue ships. But remember that you cannot be easily seen. Use the reflector in the daytime, and at night, send out signals with your flashlight periodically, not just in one direction, but to every point of the compass. That light will be visible for miles across the water. And you may be sure that somewhere, ships are scouring the sea looking for you. Yes, there are sharks in the South Seas, and barracuda, and other dangerous fish. But some of us have been close enough to touch them and didn't lose anything more than about 10 years' pleasant dreams. Very few sharks are man-eaters. The experts tell us also that a heavy underwater explosion will kill any sharks nearby and scare away all others from miles around. Brown-skinned natives of the South Seas readily swim in waters where sharks are plentiful yet they are almost never attacked. There are many cases on record of our flyers swimming fully clothed near sharks without being attacked. Maybe in their work uniforms they didn't look like good eating. But what is more likely, they were not seen. Sharks have very poor eyesight and rely mostly on their sense of smell for guidance. They are also great cowards and can be easily frightened away. There have been many instances where one or more men in the water scared off approaching sharks by simply thrashing the water. And believe me, brother, when you see a shark heading your way, you can really thrash. Even nastier than sharks are barracuda. They go for anything that attracts their attention. So avoid displaying bright objects like jewelry or insignia. And if you suspect there's any cuda around, splash that ocean. Another unpleasant South Seas native is the Portuguese man-of-war, a kind of jellyfish. He isn't a killer, but he can cause great pain and panic. If his stingers hit you, you'll think you've stirred up a hornet's nest. Don't get panicky, just relax and float. The pain will wear off in a few minutes. So grit your teeth and bear it. Naturally, you will keep a sharp lookout for planes. It's a glorious sight when you see rescue close at hand. But don't let your hopes rise too high. It may be an enemy plane. It's a Nakajima. Don't expect any quarter from the enemy. They've thrown away the book, and you are fair game. Throw off your life jacket and go underwater. Swim at right angles to the course the plane travels. Hide behind debris, raft, anything. If you happen to have a boat cover, painted a neutral color, pull it over you, hide, and pray you won't be seen. From 2,000 feet up, it's a good bet you won't. At his flying angle, your assailant's machine gun fire won't penetrate deeper than two feet in the water. And after a brief instant, he's passed out of range. Again, you take up your job of keeping afloat. Many old time sailors used to say, if your ship stays afloat, there's no need to swim. And if the ship goes down, swimming just prolongs the agony. Modern experience proves how wrong these old timers were. Sure, the waiting is tough, but men before you have stuck it out for days, even weeks. Under these circumstances, it's easy to die for your country. 
but to continue to fight for life and live to make a few Japs die for their country, that's what wins wars. So the slogan is, hang on, never give up. You haven't been forgotten. There's a rescue ship looking for you at this very moment, perhaps, just over the horizon. You're a pretty small object in all that ocean. Make them see you. Wave like hell. Now they've seen you. It's one of your old squadron. Bear a hand, stand by to board quickly. There may be submarines about. This floating net is great for picking up swimmers on the fly. The wounded should be brought aboard in a litter. If you're able, use the ladder or cargo net. But don't try to climb a line. Chances are you'll never make it. An experienced crew will lower a bosun's chair or a line with a bowline on it. Sit in the loop and let yourself be hoisted aboard. Stand clear of the side as you go up or you may leave some skin along the way. Well, lads, you made it. Congratulations. By the way, how do you feel? Maybe not so hot at the moment, but alive and still in the battle.